Hello guys and welcome back to your second lesson on détente. Now yesterday we looked at the causes and the reason for détente and now we're going to have a look at a couple of the events within détente and this period of relaxation. So our course officially ends in 1972 so there are just a couple more events we need to know about before that date comes about. Now the first thing I'm going to tell you about is something which we call SALT-1. Um, after the brinkmanship of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, there were a number of attempts to deal with the issue of nuclear weapons. The success of Nixon's visit to China earlier in the year and the ping-pong diplomacy had changed the balance of power. The relationship between the USA and China was stronger and it pushed the USSR into having to work with Nixon in order to not remain isolated and vulnerable. The strategic arms limitation talks, called SALT, began in 1969, and these were the most serious formal talks that had ever taken place between the superpowers. A number of treaties were signed that included a ban on the building of new ballistic missile launchers. Economic problems in the USSR meant that these talks were attractive to them. Talks were then held in Helsinki and Vienna over a period of almost three years, and the first agreements were produced in May 1972. This is known as SALT-1. It was officially signed at the Moscow summit of May 1972. The Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty reduced the number of anti-nuclear defence systems that were to be built. They were only allowed at two sites each containing 100 missiles. It was clear recognition of the need to protect the nuclear balance by ensuring that neither side could ever consider itself immune to retaliation. So both sides had enough that the other side would be destroyed, but neither side had significantly more than the other. There was also to be a five-year freeze on the total number of ICBM and LCB SLBM missiles. Each side was allowed to use spy satellites to ensure the other side wasn't breaking these terms. This clearly shows a significant improvement in terms of trust, if we think back to what happened with the U2 crisis earlier on. So this was a huge political achievement and the personal relationship between Nixon and Brezhnev was key. With Nixon's re-election in the 1972 elections, the leaders were keen to continue to build on the achievements of SALT-1 and talks began almost immediately for SALT-2. And here's a picture of them both signing the treaty SALT-1 in Moscow. In May of 1972, Nixon visited Brezhnev in, Mox in Moscow. The meeting was friendly despite tensions still existing over the Vietnam War. President Nixon was invited to unscheduled talks with Brezhnev at the Kremlin and the meeting lasted 105 minutes. Although US officials would not give details, the White House secretaries the two men had discussed international issues. Many observers hoped the war in Vietnam and nuclear arms would be on the agenda. For the first time in history, the American flag flew over the Kremlin to mark the visit. Later in the evening, Nixon and his wife also attended a banquet at the Kremlin. The couple walked up the red carpet and a 60 step staircase into the banqueting hall where the two presidents drank toast to peace. Nixon spoke of the, the need for cooperation and reciprocation between the two countries in their efforts to conquer disease, improve the environment and expand bilateral trade and economic links. And here's a photograph of them both in Moscow. Right, the next arena in which we're going to start seeing evidence of peace is space. Now, this program, um, of which the finality of it is behind me, was begun in 1972. So that is within our dates, but it's completed by 1975, which is outside of our dates. So it's useful to know, but you don't necessarily need to write about this in your exams and answers. In April 1972, on the back of previous agreements between Nixon and Brezhnev, the U United States and the USSR signed an agreement concerning cooperation in the exploration and use of outer space for peaceful purposes. Bit of a mouthful there. This committed the two countries to prepare for a mission in which US Apollo, um, and you've got the NASA pilots here, you can see on their jerseys they've got NASA, US Apollo and Soviet Suez and uh, the guys in green are from the USSR, spacecrafts would launch and dock in space by 1975. This would be known as the Apollo-Soviet test program. This was significant for the USSR's policy of keeping the details of their space program secret from the Soviet people 
and the world, especially America. It was the first space mission to be televised live while in space and during the landing. Furthermore, the crew from American Apollo were permitted to inspect Suez 19, as well as the launch and crew training sites. This led to information sharing between the Americans about the Soviet space program. Many Americans feared that ASTP was giving the USSR too much credit in their space program and put them on equal footing with NASA. In general, however, tensions had softened and the project set a precedent for future co cooperative projects in space up to present day, for example, the International Space Station. So that is the end of all of our content. Um, we need to go over a few small points about the detente to prepare for a question you could be asked about it, but then we are done. We will start with the question and role of individuals. Was it Brezhnev and Nixon, their personalities that created this opportunity or would it have happened anyway? Both had been involved in politics since the early days of the Cold War and were extremely distrustful of the motives of the opposing governments. Nixon's career was built on being strongly anti-communist. Brezhnev had been in the Politburo during the time of Stalin and had gone in, on to be a powerful figure under Khrushchev. Yet they worked well together. We can argue that their experience had allowed them to achieve things that younger leaders could not. They had seen the Cold War at its most tense and were determined not to return to that. In addition, as men who had held power and influence for decades, they actually had more in common with each other than they'd probably be willing to admit. The next thing I'm going to think about is how far did detente change the relationship of the superpowers? So prior to detente, the USA and the USSR had been volatile. Talks were held and progress made, but the next moment high tension was not far away. Detente represented a period of increasingly better relations. SALT-1 brought the nuclear arms race to an end, and they remained, while they remained far from allies, the end of the US involvement in Vietnam was welcomed by Moscow. Despite this, other areas of the world continued to cause tension. Now, we don't actually learn about these in our course, but I'm going to go through and tell you what happens next on Monday, just to bring the Cold War to a conclusion, because we're not currently in the Cold War. The Cold War does come to an end. Um, the Soviet Union also breaks apart, Russia is today officially not a communist country. So even though it isn't covered in our course, I'm gonna do a couple of videos for you just to talk about the end of this um, and what happens next.